Got that one, Frank. I'd like to see some magic. I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Let's head down to our feature match area for round one here at Grand Prix Prague. Hello and welcome to this round one of Grand Prix Prague and we have a former Rookie of the Year in Lino Bergold here playing in round one of this Grand Prix. Lino maybe not quite as active in these last couple of years as he has been in the past. Up against Dennis Dalgard and kicking things off with a Nihil Spellbomb here, respecting the amount of decks that really do utilize their graveyards in this format. Meanwhile on the other side of things, the old faithful Lesnerza's Tower, been working it since antiquities, kicking off with a Chromatic Sphere. Dennis Dalgard on Tron, Lino Bergold though on Fairies. Yep, so Tron is a relatively well-known archetype in uh, modern. I mean, the name Tron refers to assembling all the three Tron lands, originally dubbed the Urza Tron as a reference to the Voltron TV series where, you know, robots combine to uh, get better. Uh, for Urza Tron, it's about combining uh, the three Urza lands. And when you get those, uh, you may be able to cast something like a Karn Liberated as early as turn three. Lino Bergold, on the other hand, is playing a bit more of a, of a spicy one. Uh, put the archetype name as, uh, as fairies, uh, where Bitter Blossom, the enchantment you see there, is one of the, the key cards producing a fairy token every turn. But uh, looking over his deck list, it's not just a, a tribal fairies deck. He also has the Topter Foundry, sort of the meek combo uh, in there, which, uh, if you can put it uh, together, allows you to make a 1-1 one -one token for every mana you, uh, you sink in. So. Expect to see lots of 1-1 one -one flying tokens from, uh, from Lino, while Dennis is just uh, well, ramping up his mana towards his bigger creatures and bigger planeswalkers. Yeah, Sylvan Scrying means that we are going to be seeing turn 3 Tron from Dennis Dalgard if he wants it. Uh, I'm interested to see how it ends up pairing up against this Fairies deck though, because if Lino Bergold has appropriate counter magic to stop the first few big threats that come from the other side of the table, he could find himself in good shape here. He doesn't necessarily need to tap out for any more threats now he's got that bit of awesome on the table. Yeah, but Lino's deck doesn't actually have that much in the way of counter magic. Four spell sputters, spell stutter sprites seems to be it, and it doesn't really help as much against uh, you know seven or eight mana spells. Vanillion click is a nice way of. Uh, potentially depriving Dennis off of some powerful uh, cards. So Dennis does have access to Tron, so seven mana this turn. And, well, his biggest impact cards are Ugin, which may come down on the next turn, as well as Ulamog, which uh, could also, thanks to that expedition map, potentially come out on turn four. Um, <laughs> this is a tough pick for, uh, for Lino, because uh, if he takes either Ugin or, uh, or Ulamog, then he will probably face the other one on the, on the next turn. Yeah, it's, it's kind of unfortunate for him in a way, because I'm sure that the thinking for Lino here was take that juicy seven drop, find Khan, get rid of him before he can come down on the third turn. And here he sees that while turn three is probably not going to be very exciting for Dennis Dalgard, turn four could be an absolute monster. Yep. I mean, trying to take the Ugin is uh, at least a start, but uh, I think Lino needs something like uh, a Thoughtseize or potentially another Vendillion clique on the next turn to uh, deal with that uh, potential Ulamog. Oof, and it was a Worm Call engine that got picked up by Dennis Dalgard here. In principle, he could throw down the, the big six mana Worm here. Also not bad. Or just a walking Ballista. I guess when uh, Lino's game plan revolves around one toughness creatures, that is also uh, quite potent even has the extra mana available to cast Expedition Map there, so if he finds himself running short on lands or wants to get specifically more Urza's Towers, which is a piece of Urza Tron that taps for the most, he can do so. Yep. Shoots down that Vendillion click, and Lino Bergold, let's see what he can do next. Yeah, I just don't think Lino's deck is uh, very well suited for this uh, matchup, at least in, uh, in game one. Uh, I mean, his game plan, which is making a bunch of 1-1 flyers, uh, is not as powerful as the as the haymakers that uh, Dennis can uh, put down, and Lino's disruption. Uh, I mean, on mostly cards like Spellstutter Sprite or Inquisition of Kozilek, the deal with cheaper cards, as well as Fatal Push that deals with uh, you know low cost creatures. His main deck just doesn't really seem to be uh, up for the task here. So, Collective Brutality. We'll see how many modes he's going to go with on this one. 
Looks like so it might be the full boat here as he considers discarding two cards for this Brutality. Yeah, so then you can, uh, yep, choose an instant or sorcery card. Cannot choose uh, something like an Ulamog. So that collected br Brutality forcing the Warkeeping Ballista to shoot down some uh, fairies because it wasn't going to be long for this world thanks to the minus two, minus two. And now we get another look at this hand and it's a swing and a miss here for uh, Lino Bergold, though I guess he does get a little bit, a tiny bit of extra information there. Yeah, and I think now we are going to see the, the real power of the, the Tron deck put in place because this turn and the next, and you can just see the, the big Eldrazi coming down. Yeah, getting rid of Bitter Blossom, getting rid of a land, meaning that Lino Burgold, no cards in hand, <laughs> very little in the way of mana production here, and facing down a 10-10 that will eat his library in very quick order. Yeah, th this game is uh, a slaughter. All right, so Lino Burgold, he's going to have to uh, look to his sideboard a little bit here if he's going to find a way of winning this, back this one. Now, Tron a big enough deck in the format that it seems reasonable that Lino may have a plan here. What's he going to be looking to once he's going back to the extra 15 cards? I do like his uh, sideboard. There are a bunch of cards that he can uh, bring in. Cards like Ceremonious Rejection, Logic Knot, Disdainful Stroke, Thoughtseize, extra copies of uh, Vendillion Click, uh, also Spell Pierce, uh, potentially. Uh, meanwhile, he has plenty of weak cards like Fatal Push to uh, take out of his deck. So I do think that uh, Lino is going to uh, improve heavily after sideboard, making it much more of a, you know, a fair or, or even matchup where uh, both players have a chance. Now on the other side of things for Dennis Dalgard, I guess that one of the interesting situations that he finds himself in here is that he didn't really see a lot of what Lino's deck has going on. He saw fairies, mm -hmm. he saw Bit yes. of Blossom, and that's certainly unusual, but there's no reason to think that he would uh, pivot around anything to do with, for example, a Thopter Sword combo. He didn't see any of those uh, pieces, so no, I don't think he is uh, expecting that at all. Uh, I don't think it's even that typical to have the, the Thopter Sword combo in, uh, in a fairy shell. So uh, Lino may have some uh, surprises uh, up for Dennis. And I guess that's one of the cool things about Modern, is that it's a big enough format with enough powerful cards, and it has a sort of... Uh, a power level that's not so through the roof that there is room to innovate, there is room to do things a little bit differently, and you really can get value from opponents that are not prepared for what you have going on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and Modern is also a format where uh, the player who is more familiar, more experienced with, uh, with their deck has a large edge because uh, there's just so many decks you might, uh, might play against. It's not like you can uh, come to uh, the tournament with say, a sideboard guide against the, the top 10 decks and understand what you're supposed to do in every single matchup. Uh, you do need the, uh, the experience of uh, playing the deck with, uh, well, for a long time against a whole variety of decks to really uh, understand the, the intricacies of how you are going to adjust your deck after sideboard and what opponents might uh, actually bring in against you. And I think this is going to be one of the interesting conversations that we have throughout this weekend, Frank. So get your thinking cap on ready <laughs> for it. Um, of We've had a few big decks that have kind of begun to break out uh, around the time of the Pro Tour and a little bit thereafter that had a great weekend at the Pro Tour, for example. But there are lots of people who've been playing whatever their deck is that they like to play for a very long time. And now that they know that these new decks are a, are a factor and potentially have the ability to adjust their play or their sideboards, how well do new decks that have performed well end up doing in week two, week three, week four of mm -hmm. their time really in the spotlight? Yeah, uh, I mean, as people, uh, as you're losing the, the surprise value of, uh, of new brews, um, it, it really uh, starts to depend on their inherent power level. And that's going to be exciting to see this weekend because indeed we have seen uh, plenty of changes in modern, uh, not just over the course of the last couple weeks, but the last year really. Uh, if I look at the, the top tire modern decks that you see right now, uh, out of the top 10 modern decks, maybe over half of them uh, just didn't even exist a year ago, or at least not at, uh, at the typical competitive uh, level. Lots of new cards have been, uh, have been printed in Ixalan or also in the, the core set 2019 that have spawned new archetypes. Uh, some other decks just took a bunch of players a long time to, uh, to figure out. And yeah, for a format, with uh, like nearly 15 years of cards and non-rotating format, uh, it is uh, surprising 
and very fresh to see uh, such innovation keep going on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, it's, it's something that I think that a lot of the time, especially as we get towards just before a new set coming along, obviously Guilds of Ravnica previews starting comparatively soon, um, people start looking at, at formats that have been around for a while and talking about should there be an adjustment to the band list, should things come off band list, should things get put onto that list. And the bit that sometimes skates by not thought of <laughs> quite so much is the fact that every few months we have a few hundred new cards added to the pool for modern. Yep. And, and we do see, even though the power level of modern is clearly higher than standard, there are cards that have made big impacts in modern and have created new decks that it's, it's not just been the manipulation of that band list that ends up creating uh, new decks and new takes on the format. It's, there really are cards being added to the format that end up uh, shaking it up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, over the course of the weekend, uh, I'll be interested to see how many uh, bridge fine decks there are using a Stitcher Supplier from Core Set 19, how many uh, you know, banned spirit decks with uh, the new Spirit Lord from the same set, uh, how many human decks are uh, abusing Militia Boogler, another edition. Uh, also curious to see how many people will show up with Hardened Scales, a deck that may not really uh, use newly printed cards as much as those other decks, but uh, which has been rising in popularity on uh, Magic Online and doing super well at the most recent Magic Online Championship Series. Uh, so lots of innovation, it just keeps coming and I'm, I'm just really pumped for this entire weekend. Oh yeah, it's, it's going to be great. Like mm. Modern weekends always are. Um, we do see Dennis Dalgard here starting on a multi six and scrying to the bottom, so it may be that he's not quite as explosive this game too. I can't say that I necessarily mind too much because I'm really intrigued to see a little bit more of what uh, Lino Burgold's deck has to offer now that we hit post sideboard games. There you can see a Sword of the Meek still yep. in his deck after sideboarding. No need to hide that one away. No, you need some, some win conditions uh, still. Uh, yeah, what, what I expect to see uh, this game, uh, how it might play out, is that Lino will uh, try to put on some, uh, some quick pressure with cards like Vendelian Clique or uh, Bitter Blossom to at least have a clock and exploit that with some disruption in the form of, for example, Ceremonious Rejection or, or Tatsis to uh, prevent Dennis from resolving well, those uh, big haymakers on turn 3 or turn 4. And if Lino can, uh, can do that, uh, you know, keep uh, Dennis's uh, board clear of any seven, eight, or ten mana cards while uh, attacking for a bit of points uh, in the air. Then uh, Lino may be able to uh, turn it around. He is going to have to win two on the bounce here if he's going to uh, get out of round one with the win. Early doors, chromatic sphere, drawing a card here for Dennis Delgard. It's it's kind of crazy to me in a way that. Obviously, we think about Tron as being the deck that p powers out all these haymakers. It's got a lot of card drawing on the slide between Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star, uh, this Ancient Stirrings here, which we see getting countered in this case. Um, it's able to dig through its deck really quite impressively, considering that it's a mono green deck. Yeah, uh, Ancient Stirrings in particular is, uh, uh, I guess, part of the glue that holds the deck uh, together, adding uh, a lot of consistency in, um, in the attempt of finding all three Tron pieces. So you can tap them for uh, large amounts of mana. So there's not going to be a turn three Tron for uh, for Dennis at least, thanks to that uh, that forest. Although the expedition map does make it likely that he will be able to assemble uh, all three Tron pieces by turn four. Almost every format that Urza's Tron has been available in, it's ended up doing pretty good work. Uh, originally, of course, in antiquities and. At Back in the early days of Magic, it was a little bit more difficult to get all of those uh, lands in play at the same time. But even in the likes of Pauper, there was an occasion that uh, Tron pieces ended up being pretty potent. Yep. I do like the decision, by the way, of spell piercing the, the ancient uh, stirrings. Sometimes uh, you might think, well, I'll try to keep the spell pierce for, I don't know, say uh, a Karn or something. But uh, all too often, that falls into the trap of uh, just giving the Tron player too much time to assemble their mana and spell pierce's value uh, vastly diminishes uh, as the game goes on because you know at some point the Tron player will just have a Tron land up to uh, pay the two mana. Okay, so here we see ex expedition map getting cracked. Likely to be a Tron piece, though there are a few other interesting utility lands in the in the Tron deck that occasionally come out. That one being as power plant that's just been fetched there. 
Well, getting the Tron online is always the, the first priority. Um, what Lino is really missing here is uh, some kind of pressure. Uh, maybe if he can add Vendelian Clique to the table on this turn, might still be okay, but my guess is that if he had that card, he would have uh, played it in uh, Dennis's draw step to try to uh, look at his hand before Dennis can cast any spells in his main phase. But um, you know, this is a matchup where you cannot give the Tron player infinite time. I think if the game goes long, then eventually the tr uh, Dennis will just cast Ulamog, and yeah, ev even a counter spell is not going to help uh, all that much against it. So you do need some pressure to uh, start with a damage clock. Yeah, I guess that's one of the things that's attractive about Tron if you're looking for a deck to play in modern, is that in terms of late game, it has one of the most powerful late games, or oh sorry, powerful uses of lots of mana mm -hmm. of almost any of the decks in the format. But Lino Bergold, he's made it up to four mana here before anything too scary has come along from Dennis Dalgard. And with triple blue available, in principle, he may even have the likes of Cryptic Command here if he's looking for hard counters for what Dennis has going on. Well, actually, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that Dennis is thinking exactly about Cryptic Command right now because it's such a, a prevalent blue card and also often seen in Fairy's decks. Interestingly, Lino does not play it. He does not have Cryptic Command in his deck list. Uh, of course, it can give you a bit of an edge if opponents play around it and you don't even have it. Yeah, I guess he had to make room to fit in the, the top to sword combo and we'll have to cut something. Disdainful stroke here. He knew it was going to be an answer to essentially anything that Tron was going to get going on this fourth turn in any big capacity. Wormcoil Engine was ultimately the victim of that one. And a yep. follow-up, Sylvan Scrying, there was still one mana floating from the seven that mm -hmm. were produced by Ezatron, meaning that Dennis Dalgard, even if he was a turn late to get his Tron going, from now on out he's just going to have absolutely masses of mana. Yep. And, yeah, well, sure, Lino can uh, counter one card and maybe he has uh, some counter magic for the next threat. But um, I mean eventually that Ulamog is coming out and that we also see the Sanctum being uh, being searched by Sylvan's Crying. That is a land that uh, will allow you to search for, uh, well, let's say powerful Eldrazi's. Whenever you cast uh, a colorless card with seven, with cost seven or more, I believe. And of course, the reason we keep talking about Ulamog rather than various of the other threats that can be thrown out here by uh, the Tron list is that Ulamog's trigger that uh, exiles two permanents, that's a cast trigger rather than it being um, relying on the spell actually resolving. Mm -hmm. And that means that even if Lino Burgold is leaning back on counter magic very, very heavily, he could still come a cropper when it comes to the likes of U uh, Ulamog. Sorry. Walking Melissa for Axis 4, which is enough to be able to sacrifice the, the Sanctum. So, looking for a colorless creature. Man, that spell stutter sprite in uh, Lino's hand is uh, just very, very sad. Might have been useful on, you know, turn 2 maybe to counter, uh, say, an Ancient Stirrings uh, or an Expedition Map, that kind of card. Right now, it is not doing, uh, doing much. Without any other fairies to improve the power. Uh, or the potency of spells that are sprite. Yeah, not great in this matchup. So we see Logic not dealing with the Walking Ballista itself, um, but in some respects the damage has already been done. Sanctum of Mugen has found uh, mm. Ulamog himself, and while counter magic perfectly reasonable against the likes of that Walking Ballista, not going to do too much against the big Eldrazi. I guess you can still counter it. Whoa, spells that are sprite. Hooray! Finally did get to do something. Living its its best life there, dealing with one mana threats. Okay, now we have a twenty turn clock. Or actually, uh, no, it's uh, faster. There's also a creeping tar pit. So this is a five turn clock. Start. And of course, subsequent spell starter strikes sprites only getting better now that there's already one fairy on the battlefield. Oh yeah. So that's uh, uh, mine. Yeah. So that's ten mana. That's Ulamog mana. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it turns out that Dennis doesn't really like this whole plan of uh, being able to attack for a lot. Ceremonious rejection, at least meaning that uh, Ulamog not getting to stay in play. However, dealing with a couple of threats means that Lino Burgold is pretty well set back here. Yeah, so now, well, every the, the whole board is, uh, is empty. Um, but Dennis is uh, hugely favored here because, I mean, his deck is just filled with more powerful cards and he's under no pressure at all. 
He just keeps asking uh, asking questions. Well, do you have an answer for Wormcrawl Engine? No. And I'm not sure that uh, Lino has a great way of dealing with a resolved uh, Wormcrawl Engine. It's not like he has decent removal spells against it. So maybe the only real plan I can see for Lino is drawing Sword of the Meek followed by Thopter Foundry. Get that combo off where you can make a 1-1 one -one Thopter for every mana you sink in. And then we'll just start jump blocking the Wormcall engine while growing your Topter army turn after turn. Yeah, it, the but life titles are going to get very strange if that happens because the Wormcall engine's lifelink, we can already see it putting Dennis <laughs> Delgard to 22 here. And if Lino's gaining life and generating Thopters while Dennis is gaining life and attacking with the Wormcall engine, things getting very messy, it may be that Ugin the Spirit Dragon, having now resolved, will be enough to mean that even that plan of Lino's no longer looking quite good enough here. Uh, yeah, this is just uh, slamming the door on uh, on the game. I, I don't think that there is a sequence of cards uh, that can help Lino to get back from this uh, spot. Seems like he agrees, because there is the handshake. That meaning that Dennis Dalgard picking up the first win of the day. This is not the point where you are uh, locking up day two. It's not the point, certainly, where you're starting to think about getting a title or anything like that. This is simply the point where you go, you breathe a little sigh of relief and go, <laughs> right, I've got my first win under my belt, I guess that this is how, it, as much as I could ever hope to be at this stage in the day. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that first monkey off your, off your back, basically. I think Lino at this point may be hoping uh, to draw Bitter Blossom more, uh, more reliably on, uh, on turn two. I think if he had Bitter Blossom this game on turn two, you know, to, to have the pressure so that uh, his, his counter magic would have actually been uh, you know, useful in uh, progressing, uh, he might have had a much bigger chance, but uh, he'll need to find that, uh, that card more often uh, today. Well, we will have more magic for you here from round one of Grand Prix Prague and indeed an announcement about some of the cool coverage things that we've got planned for Grand Prix Richmond soon enough. Do not go anywhere because we'll be back with more magic after these messages.
and welcome back to coverage of Grand Prix Prague. Tim Willoughby and Frank Carsten here, bringing you all the action here from round one of our modern Grand Prix. We've already had a chance to see one kind of interesting deck, uh, Fairies, a little bit of an unusual choice uh, in the hands of Lino Burgold, ultimately succumbing to the power of Ulamog and friends in Tron. But we're going to get a chance to head back down to our feature match area for some time walk magic now. Uh, basically, we try and record as much magic as we can so that each and every time that we get to the end of our main match, we can bring you a whole extra match or two. And we're going to have one of the decks that you particularly like <laughs> in this format, Frank. We're going to head back down to our feature match area and get a chance to see well, Felix Koffel, he's got goblins. That I'm kind of excited about. But Benjamin Polmeyer on the other side of things, he's playing Bridgevine. I mean, both decks are, uh, are super exciting to me, to be honest. Uh, the Bridgevine deck was uh, arguably the breakout deck at uh, Pro Tour 25th uh, anniversary. The two namesake cards, uh, Bridge from Below and Vengevine, only really have value when they're in the graveyard. Uh, but they allow for some really explosive starts where with uh, an ideal draw, you might have uh, as much as eight power on the battlefield by turn one. Uh, and the bridge find deck was largely uh, fueled by Stitcher Supplier uh, from Corset 2019. Uh, but Felix's deck is also pretty sweet. Uh, it's uh, I mean it's goblins with bushwhackers, with goblin grenades, pile drivers, but also with uh, the flame of Kelt. Uh, I'm also very interested to see how that works out and you know this 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 whole matchup to me exemplifies what modern is about you never know what you might face next so we saw a turn one goblin guide there from felix attacking in revealing an insolent neonate a card that benjamin palmeyer probably doesn't mind having too much he led off with faithless losing though and having already put a blood gust and a bridge from below in the graveyard that means that he has the potential at least to get something pretty big going relatively quickly here and that's kind of what the bridge vine deck's all about if it can get a fast start. It has one of the scarier fast starts in the entire format. It'll just be a matter of seeing whether or not it can achieve it. Yep. Uh, we'll we'll get to the bridge fine uh, deck soon enough. But uh, Felix is also going off with a very strong start here. Uh, Burning Tree Emissary into Rectus Bushwhacker, which will give uh, all of his creatures haste and plus one plus zero. So getting in for nine damage, uh, or no, sorry, eight uh, eight damage here. <laughs> putting Benjamin down to 10 on turn yeah. 2. This is uh, uh, a very fast start. And, you know, if Felix holds maybe two goblin grenades in hand, he might finish it off on turn 3. That would be pretty exciting. I mean, this is a time walk match. We have the potential in principle to be able to speed it up. At this point, we may need to slow it down <laughs> in order to make sure <laughs> yeah. that we get uh, enough magic on our hands here. But uh, but now we get to see the, the power of the bridge find deck in action because Benjamin did have an excellent first turn where he, uh, you know, got to set up with two cards that uh, are better off in the graveyard than in his hand. Bridge from below will uh, produce a 2-2 zombie token uh, when one of your creatures dies. So that's uh, pretty sweet in the graveyard. Bloodgust just comes back uh, for free. And now Benjamin has a bunch of options. For example, he can uh, play Insolent Neonate, uh, sacrifice it and get a 2-2 zombie. He can play Hangerback Walker for zero, uh, which will die, but then it also produces uh, a zombie. Or just discard the Gravecrawler, which uh, will be able to come back from the graveyard when you have a zombie. And, well, there, there's one. So lots of, uh, lots of synergy and ways of, uh, you know, adding power to the battlefield without having to invest additional mana. That is what the Bridgevine deck is, uh, is about. Making the best use of, uh, of the graveyard. Now, worth noting, a line that generally isn't mm -hmm. really considered too much for uh, Cannot block. players. Both Bloodgast and... Uh, Gravecrawler cannot block. Correct. I mean, generally speaking, it's something that creatures that can repeatedly come back from the graveyard tend not to be able to block. Uh, ever since uh, Nether Spirit, or oh, I'm sorry, Nether Shadow, Nether Spirit, yes, from uh, Macadian Masks, it, it was realized quite how powerful it is having creatures that just keep on coming back and are unable to be blocked. But here it may well be that uh, Benjamin Paul Meyer has to reconcile himself with losing his copy of Bridge from Below because I think he really is going to have to think about blocking <laughs> very, very soon yep. everything that's going on from Felix Kuffel's side of the battlefield. I mean, it was still a really good turn for, uh, for Benjamin. Right? He, he invested two mana and he got 10 power <laughs> onto the battlefield. Uh, and yeah, he does have uh, blockers for all of Felix's uh, creatures now. So it looks like Felix uh, has decided, well, I'm probably not going to be able to uh, get in for a whole lot of extra damage. Right, creatures would just trade uh, this turn. Uh, I'm gonna dig into my deck for uh, the goblin grenades. 
in the hope of finishing uh, off. Of Keld. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Um, I'm a bit surprised that uh, Felix doesn't actually uh, attack here, because uh, if you attack with, say, the Burning Tree Emissary, Benjamin pretty much has to uh, block with a zombie token to protect his life total, which would mean that the Burning Tree Emissary dies, and Bridge from Below, the enchantment in the graveyard, is exiled whenever a creature on the opposing side uh, dies. And I think trying to exile the, the bridges from the bridge front player is, uh, can be quite uh, important. Now, one of the pieces of the puzzle that we've not yet seen from uh, Palmer's side of things is use of sacrifice outlets. Because he's got things like this uh, blood gasp, because he's got the grave crawler that he can get back time and time again, if he's able to find a sacrifice outlet here, his deck really goes into rocket speed. Oh, yeah. Uh, especially when you combine sacrifice outlets with grave crawlers, just invest one like mana to uh, get a free 2 2 zombie. Potentially more zombies if you have multiple bridges in, uh, in the graveyard. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange sort of a staring contest that we find going on here. And the fact that Felix Koffel was on the play has ended up meaning that he's got Benjamin Polmeyer in, in virtual check here. He, he knows that he may be facing game over very, very soon just because of how aggressive the red deck on the other side of the table could be. But interestingly also for Polmeyer, we, we spoke about it a little bit in game one, there's been some unusual cards played in this game one <laughs> from, the, from the other side of the table. And that means that if you're Paul Meyer, you have to concede the fact that something unusual might be coming along in the future that you simply haven't prepared for. Uh, yeah, for sure. The Goblins is not uh, an archetype that is played heavily. And the Flame of Kelt is a card that I, I don't think I've seen it being played in modern before. Of course, it's a relatively recent edition, uh, one of the sagas from uh, Dominaria. But, uh, well, Felix's deck does contain Lightning Bolt, Mock Fanatic, and Goblin Grenade as uh, burn spells. So if he finds uh, at least two of those cards uh, near the top of his deck, so that he can uh, play it also potentially with the third chapter of the Flame of Kelt, he should be able to uh, close out this game, and I'm sure that that is what Benjamin is also uh, worried about. I don't think that uh, Benjamin will be able to uh, put on enough pressure to uh, win the game before that third chapter on uh, the Flame of Kelt goes off. So I think Benjamin will have to uh, try to protect his uh, life total so that he doesn't die to, say, a single burn spell while, I mean, trying to start to get in for, uh, for some damage. Would make sense to at least attack with Gravecrawler and Bloodgust, which cannot block. Ooh, but maybe the Bushwhacker m could change that. Uh, perhaps Benjamin could try to uh, win within uh, two swings. But I don't think he has lethal here. No, he definitely does not. And if he swings all out, well, that could be very dangerous because then Felix can just fall down to uh, maybe a couple points of life but retain some of his creatures and win on the on the backswing. Um, yeah, if I were Benjamin, I would just uh, keep back probably three blockers just to be safe. Not sure I would have even played the, the Blood Crypt to deal damage to myself. That just feels very dangerous against uh, a red deck, but uh, well, at least you get to uh, get in for a whole bunch of damage here. So if you're Felix Kuffel um, here, at least one block seems to make sense. Not so much to prevent damage, but just to make sure that you get rid of that bridge from below without having to worry about too many more zombies coming along, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, important here is the, you know, when, when two play, two creatures die at the same time. Uh, so then you get a trigger from bridge from below from your own creatures, but also the exile trigger from your opponent's creatures. It goes active player, non-active player. So the exile ability from the non-active player uh, resolves first. I believe that is how it works. So then bridge from below is exiled and you don't get any tokens from your own creatures that, uh, that die. Well, it looks, I'm not 100% on how the, the ruling on that one goes, but it looks like the bit that we know for sure is that the, the bridges are going away. Two copies of Bridge from Below, as it turns out. I'm yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not 100% on that, uh, that interaction. 
it is possible that you control both triggers and then you can stack them as you, uh, as you like. As things stand, Felix Kufel here drawing a yeah, couple of extra going cards on. on his turn so that he's yep. able to get things oh. going on. He got the Goblin Grenade and Lightning Bolt. Wow. Yeah, does not need to wait for this Flame it's gonna of It's going to be Geld. lethal. Goblin Grenade originally from Fallen Empires, but it came back and that meant that it is legal in modern and enough to take game one. Felix Kuffel with his goblins getting things going here. Looks like there was a scry from him in game two though, so starting on less than the full grip of seven. And let's see whether or not this time Benjamin Palmeyer can have one of those dream starts for Bridgevine. I mean, he's, he's managed to find himself a Stitcher Supplier early doors. Stitcher Supplier, definitely one of the pieces of the puzzle that really helps get this deck going. Oh yeah. Well, Fatalist Looting and Insolent Neonate are uh, arguably still more important because they allow you to uh, discard a Venge Vine or Bridge from below uh, from your hand. Whereas Stitcher Supplier, you still need to be a bit lucky that uh, they are lurking near the top of your deck. But uh, definitely adds some additional consistency. So one thing that um, Felix Kuffel's deck has going for it, just in terms of a sort of natural matchup factor, is it runs a, a bunch of copies of Mog Fanatic, and Mog Fanatic, a creature that can very easily get rid of copies of Bridge from Below whenever it wants. Yep. That is definitely a card that, uh, just like, you know, uh, Sakura Tribe Elder or Walking Ballista, those cards have uh, shot up in value a little bit after Bridge from Below got more uh, popular. I need to uh, clarify, also reading uh, some comments in, uh, in the chat, it does seem like the the player controlling or owning Bridge from Below controls both triggers, both the Exile one and the Create a Zombie one. You do need to stack them correctly, uh, but uh, you can choose the order and y you can just have the Make a 2-2 ability resolve first. So here we see uh, turn to Stitcher Supplier into Stitcher Supplier. There's already one Venture Vine in the graveyard. Ooh. So a pretty exciting turn to it, must be said, all told. Bloodgast also getting to into the battlefield here. I mean, eight power by uh, by turn two is uh, definitely not too bad. All right, 16 life apiece, but right now Benjamin Palmeyer with a far more intimidating looking board. And often you see that the Bridgevine uh, player has to play, say, a Hangerback Walker for zero, uh, just to get back to Vengevine uh, from the graveyard. Benjamin didn't even have to do that just playing some uh, regular creatures. Now there's a Relic of Progenitus in hand here for Felix Kuffel. How big a deal is that in terms of uh, stymieing the plans of a Bridgevine player? Uh, well, if it uh, cost zero mana and uh, was there earlier, it uh, would have been useful. At this point, it's, it's a bit late. Um, I mean, Graveyard Hate is the best possible uh, uh, sideboard uh, type of card that you can bring in against the Bridgevine deck because it is a deck that revolves all around the graveyard. However, because this deck is so potent in uh, you know, uh, doing broken stuff on turn one or turn two, cards like Relic of Progenitus or, or even Rest in Peace, which are <laughs> relatively slow in that regard, may just come down uh, too late. It's still, it's still useful, um, but yeah, it's not gonna uh, deal with the eight power that is currently already on the battlefield. I've certainly seen more than a fair share of players scrabbling around trying to find specifically Leyline of the Void. Uh -huh. That's the one that, assuming that you can get it on turn one, or turn zero, I guess, um, it's able to properly close the door on what the Bridgevine deck has going on. Yeah, I, I agree. I also uh, recently uh, changed the, the rest in pieces I had on my Affinity sideboard to uh, Leyline of the Void. And one of the main reasons was this uh, appearance of the Bridgevine deck, which yeah, as I mentioned, it's just capable of doing all these broken things so early in the game. And now a couple of Stitcher suppliers die. I saw a Bloodgust being milled into the graveyard. Not much else though at the, at the moment. Still, I probably wouldn't order the Bloodgust surprise at a restaurant. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like if you're Felix Kuffel right now and you've got this Relic of Progenitus in play, now is not the time to pop it. You need a few juicier targets to, to make it worthwhile. But in the meantime, that means that if there's a land in hand here for Benjamin Palmeyer, 
he can get that blood, blood, blood gas back. Yep. And then he can also flash back the, the Fateless looting, which may not be as valuable when there's still Relic uh, on the table, but, but still. So here we yep. see Benjamin, he's, he's just holding that blood gust, representing the fact that it's triggers on the stack having played a land. Because in principle, Felix could get rid of graveyards right now. Uh, true, and I do think he has to, at least has to try something. But Benjamin will be able to respond to this activation by indeed sacrificing that Eridmiza to get another landfall uh, trigger so that the Bloodgast will uh, return to the battlefield before the Relic activation uh, resolves. That's the power of fetch lands with uh, with Bloodgast. Now, this Vendrine, this sorry, this Bloodgast right now does not have haste. Uh, the, set no. of, the set of attacks that's coming from uh, Palmyre soon enough will be enough to make sure that future Bloodgasts do have haste. Once your opponent is at ten or fewer life, all Bloodgasts end up with haste once they're bloodied in D and D terms. <laughs> So here's the power of Bridgevine, able to immediately after a graveyard has been dealt with, another Fateless Looting comes along, and it might mean that the amount of time for which Benjamin Palmyre is left without cool cards in his graveyard is virtually zero. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not long. Um, discarding the, the X cards, which are <laughs> most often just cast for zero mana to uh, trigger Vengevine or uh, Rich from Below, seems reasonable. And now Benjamin can just spend the rest of his mana to add other relevant uh, threats to the board. Benjamin is uh, super far ahead because you know the, the Goblins deck, it's also an aggro deck. It's not great at uh, defending. And, well, it's a whole lot of power that is uh, entering the battlefield here. Yeah, the Greater Gargadon, it's power not currently on the, on the battlefield. No, but, but soon. As a sacrifice outlet, it's a really good one for this deck. It lets you do as much sacrificing as you typically would need to, each of those sacrifices taking a suspend counter off the Gargadon, and I definitely have seen big old Gargadons hitting the red zone uh, in, with this deck as well. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, probably not on the next turn, but uh, the turn after could easily, uh, easily happen. I do like how uh, Benjamin in his uh, deck split the difference between three Greater Gargadon and one Viserys here, uh, deciding that, well, I do need four Sacrifice Outlets to uh, reliably trigger my uh, Bridge from below, but I do not want to draw multiple uh, Greater Gargadons, because uh, that is uh, typically pretty useless. And so likewise, multiple Viserys here, right? Yeah, like same. If you end up with both of them on the battlefield at the same time, you'd rather have one of each. Yeah, but if he decides that, well, I if, I, if I draw one, I'd rather have Greater Gargadon, Splitting it three and one is uh, a good deck building approach. So Burning Tree MS3 into Goblin Pile Driver coming along from Felix Kuffel there. The Pile Driver not best friends with the MS3, but it doesn't mind getting put into play with another creature in a pinch. Yep. And here come the swings from Palmyre. He's unafraid of everything that's going on on the other side of the battlefield here. Now he just has to block because this is uh, lethal coming his way. Ten damage total. Um, but yeah, you're not really happy to block any of these creatures because they uh, could return to the battlefield uh, pretty easily from the graveyard. Uh, I mean, to return to the graveyard, Bloodgast needs a land. That seems fairly easy. Vengevine needs two creatures. It might be a bit more difficult. Uh, although it is worth noting that uh, casting Greater Gargadon also counts uh, towards that potentially. Uh, for Gravecrawler, you do need a zombie. Not that Bloodcast is a spirit, not a zombie, or a, a vampire. Uh, a vampire spirit, in fact. Oh, oh well, okay. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> Didn't even know that. Um, yeah, the, the chum block is, of course, also an option. If you expect that the creatures are coming back. But uh, I'm not sure what Felix's game plan is. Uh, I don't think his deck has basically the tools to come back from uh, from this spot. Not when Benjamin is still at 15 life. You're not going to be able to burn uh, burn out against that high of a life total. And we see Vengevine getting sacrificed here to Greater Gargadon. That's signaling to me that likely to be a couple of creatures still to be cast on the other side of things. Insolent Neonate coming down. That the first creature cast this turn. 
and a grave crawler from hand. That enough to get back Benchbone. So that just nice clean play there from Palmyra, making sure that given that he's casting a couple of creatures anyway, that he might as well get that Benchbone back, get a counter off the uh, Greater Gargadon in the proce process. Get all the value. And yeah, if, if you're Felix Koffel here, I don't know quite what you're <laughs> you're hoping to achieve. I mean, e even if you could come up with something like an Anger of the Gods, which he doesn't have, then Benjamin would just sacrifice all of his creatures to Greater Gargadon so that they wouldn't even be exiled. I, I, I cannot think of anything uh, in the format at this point. All right, so we're going to head to a game three on this one. At this point, both these players have shown off what their decks can do. I think it's going to be critical for game mm. three the fact that we have the Goblins player on the play. That's For kind sure. of the place where he needs to make his real mark on this game. It, it is a damage, it, it, it's, a, it's a race matchup with both decks capable of uh, potential three turn three kills. So being on the play and getting in that early damage helps a lot. Uh, another, I think, important factor is whether or not uh, we will see Mock Fanatic, uh, which can, uh, of course, exile the bridge from below uh, at will. That could also be a key card in a matchup. Um, and I guess finally that even Relic of Progenitors, if you cast it on yep. turn one and have it ready to activate on turn two, might be good enough. But we'll, we'll find out. Let's head back down for game three now. When you are in the play, that might be uh, in time still. Yeah. All right. So Felix kicking things off here. Looks like he's got a couple no of drop. Bushwhacker effects going on. That is very bad news for the Goblin player. Uh, this is a deck that uh, wants to get out of the gates quickly and really wants to start with uh, a creature on turn one. Uh, whatever it is, basically. So I hope that uh, there's going to be maybe some Burning Tree Emissaries and additional creatures on turn two for Felix. Otherwise, he's going to have a hard time. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question becomes, without a one drop, what is the hand that you're keeping? And it, it has to be one that's powering out something pretty impressive on turn two. Bridge from below already in the graveyard for Benjamin Palmyre as uh, that Stitcher Supplier gives a little bit more action to work with for him. A lot of copies of various bushwhackers in hand but goblin guide late to the party on turn two looks like it might be that felix kufel on the wrong side of some mulligans here yeah indeed i see four cards in hand which means that he mulliganed down to five cards and yeah then you sometimes just have to keep uh, a hand without a one drop but uh <laughs> the turn two goblin guide don't even attack is uh, uh a bit sad though perhaps it is uh, the best line that uh, felix has available uh, to him uh, it's, it has a low likelihood of succeeding, but trying to take the control role uh, might actually uh, give him uh, a reasonable uh, shot, at least give him more time to find the lands and spells he needs. I mean, he certainly wouldn't have wanted to attack there because Stitcher Supplier quite happy to get killed off and oh create yeah, yeah. more cards in the graveyard, and there's already a bridge from below. So this is desperate times for Felix Kuffel here. Yep. Viscera Seer available alongside Insolent Neonate here, so a lot of deck manipulation available to Benjamin Palmer. Yeah, the Viserys here will allow Benjamin to sacrifice his Stitcher Supplier at will, thereby milling him uh, for additional cards into the graveyard. Maybe uh, maybe a Vengevine, since Benjamin probably wants to play Insolent Neonate uh, afterwards. It makes sense to uh, sacrifice Stitcher Supplier first to see if there is a Vengevine in the top, not just top three, top four, because you get a scry. All right. So far, Stitcher Supplier, well, it did create additional cards in the graveyard, didn't really create very many useful cards in that graveyard. A couple of lands and uh, I think that was a hangerback walker there. Mm -hmm. Maybe a walking ballista. But I mean, still, still pretty good getting uh, like all the value off of the, the bridge from below, at least. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny that this is us watching the Bridgevine deck have a very medium draw, certainly not an exciting draw, and it's still able to achieve quite a bit. We can see, it looks like there's an ingot chewer in hand there for Benjamin Palmer. That, I would have to assume, is coming from the sideboard, given that he's seen that the... Uh, that the uh, Graveyard hate available to Felix Kuffel is um, the relic of uh, Progenitus. Yeah, it is uh, a good answer to that. Uh, it, when you're playing a deck like Bridgevine, I guess that a lot of sideboard cards are about protecting what you've got going on rather than really aggressively attacking your opponent's strategy. Uh, that is uh, indeed, uh, indeed the case. 
And also when you know that Felix is going to be on the play, that uh, Relic of Pagenesis could be much more powerful. So it makes sense to bring in uh, Ingo Tewer. I like uh, Benjamin's sideboard, actually. Next to the Ingo Tewer, he also has uh, Wisp Mare, uh, along with some white uh, sources, as an answer to the other heavily played Graveyard Hate cards in Rest in Peace and Leyland of the Void. And, you know, at worst, these creatures just say, well, if you have a bridge from below in the graveyard, one mana, make a 2-2 zombie, or perhaps get back uh, Vengevine. As things stand, Benjamin Palmeyer, he's getting to do it all because on the other side of things, Felix Kufel is not playing goblins, he's playing goblin. <laughs> and unfortunately, that not notoriously known as a deck that is winning very many GPs. Yeah, it's a very sad and lonely uh, goblin. Um, I mean, Benjamin still has to, uh, you know, it, it's not over yet. He still has to make sure that he puts up uh, enough pressure to win the game uh, before Felix might draw into land, land, and start to uh, develop his board. But, uh, yeah, he does have a huge advantage here. And at least we get to see the, the power of the bridge find deck in action, what it is uh, capable of when the opponent is not exactly disrupting it. A yeah, bit of mana available here. More copies of Insolent Neonate. Benjamin still kind of digging a little bit to get uh, more powerful cards into the graveyard. While uh, creating some uh, some zombies. Yeah, with Goblin Bushwhacker, this might be the point where you just put down the Bushwhacker, give everything haste, and swing in with uh, everything. Sure, Felix might be able to block with the Goblin Guide, thereby exiling the bridge from below, but at this point, you're already so far ahead on, uh, on board that uh, that is uh, not a problem. I mean, with Viscera here in play, you can even just sacrifice the creature that gets blocked. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that's a nice uh, play. keep things going. Yep. Now, bridge from below only triggering off non-token creatures going to the graveyard, otherwise you'd have horrible infinite <laughs> loops of Zombies begetting zombies yeah, yeah, yeah. begetting zombies. Infinite cries, yeah, that wouldn't really be uh, be fair. Uh, but even even as things stand, a very very powerful card, the enchantment that, while you technically can cast it and get it onto the battlefield, its its uses in play are comparatively small. And I like this play here from Benjamin Palmeyer. He casts his uh, bushwhacker with the trigger on the stack, sacrifices mm -hmm. the bushwhacker, such that when the trigger resolves, that zombie that's just come into play, it's still got plus one power and haste. Very nice uh, sequencing indeed. It shows that Benjamin is very well familiar with uh, all the potential lines that his deck uh, has access to. And I think attacking with everything uh, is perfectly reasonable. And then maybe uh, if the Goblin Guide blocks the Viserys here, which I think seems to be the best option in an attempt to at least exile the bridge from below, it might be worth sacrificing Viserys here, as you also mentioned before damage so that uh, you still keep your own bridge from below around in the graveyard for uh, future use. I mean, it, it may well be that, to be perfectly honest, it, that's not even required because Palmer are already so far ahead, but I, I do like keeping bridge from below in the graveyard if there's an easy way of doing so. Nope. <laughs> no blocks at all. M maybe Benjamin is sweating it. Uh-oh, am I going to be facing the mountain uh, triple burning tree emissaries uh, bushwhacker now am i dead did i oh, okay no no it turns out <laughs> that that is all she wrote there's the handshake uh, benjamin no. palmer picking up a relatively straightforward game there in our round one yeah, and no. given the briskness of that match it does mean that frank we're going to get a chance to see still more magic from our feature match area let's head done. back down we get a chance to see stefan emmert on storm against manuel danninger on storm it is oh going boy. to be a crazy race here. Not a huge amount of interaction, at least in game one, I wouldn't imagine, between t these two decks. And it's just going to be a matter of who's going to be able to get together the perfect storm first. Uh, yeah, the, the storm mirror is not something uh, <laughs> I was expecting to see, but uh, of course we don't have access to every single uh, uh, deck list uh, very early in the morning as we are choosing the, the feature matches. But uh, what is this deck trying to do? Well, storm is uh, a combo deck that is ultimately trying to build up to uh, a gigantic grape shot turn. So it is capable of casting a whole lot of spells in a single turn uh, by combining creatures that uh, reduce the cost of your spells with uh, mana generating rituals. A key card in the deck uh, is Gibson Given, which uh, generally finds uh, Desperate Ritual, Pyretic Ritual, Mana Morphos and Past and Flames, because Past and Flames 
has flashback and allows you to cast instant and sorceries from your graveyard. It effectively doesn't really matter which two cards the opponent puts in your hand and which two go to the graveyard. And after such a gift and given, especially if there's such a, a cost-reducing creature on the battlefield, uh, a competent Storm player will generally always be able to uh, combo off on the, on the next turn. Now, you mentioned cost-reducing creatures. These are very important in the early stage of this game because you see their Manamorphose being cast by Stefan Emma. That is mana neutral but draws you a card. Once you've got a mana reducing creature in play, that's generating mana for you, and that's one of the big ways that you get these huge, huge storm counts up and running. So the fact that Stefan does not have a cost reducing creature on turn two may mean that even though he was on the play, he's actually a little bit behind in this game one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Storm is a deck that uh, can potentially combo off turn uh, turn three, um, perhaps more consistently on uh, on turn four. But you do want to uh, be able to get the, the key pieces on the table as quickly as possible, especially in this matchup where there's not going to be a whole lot of interaction. At least in game one, I mean, the interactive elements are maybe a grape shot on your opposing uh, Goblin Electromancer, perhaps a random Remond or, uh, you know, and, and some unsubstantiate or repeal on uh, some opposing uh, spell or card but uh, by and large these uh, two players will just try to uh, go for their goldfish kill as quickly as possible. Baral Chief of Compliance has come down for Manuel Daninger and there is a grape shot in hand for Stefan Emmert. If he wanted to here he could choose to play a few spells and then point a grape shot at that uh, Baral because yeah, I think that's worth it. Otherwise, he's potentially going to lose this very next turn. Yep. And, I mean, generally, you don't really need the, the Grape Shot in, uh, in your hand. When you are comboing off in a big turn, well, you usually have Past and Flames at some point and can just cast the lethal game-winning Grape Shot from, uh, from the graveyard. So using it on turn three to kill, say, uh, a Baral is going to be uh, typically worth it. So here you see how we're demonstrating the various things that you end up having to count with the Storm deck. We've got an island to represent how much blue mana is knocking around, mountains to represent the red mana that's been generated by Mana Morphos, and then a Storm counter that's simply a die there. It may be at some point that we end up needing a bigger die as Baral Chief of Compliance comes along alongside a Poetic Ritual. Now, right now, no additional blue mana available, but Mana Morphos will change that. And it looks like Stefan Emma may be able to go off here. On turn three, we, having cast the Baral on his turn three is pretty impressive. He's at least uh, trying. Yeah, I thought this was just going to be a turn where you go uh, Mana Morphos, let's say uh, one Mana card draw spell and Grape Shot the Baral, but the Mana Morphos card draw provided him with uh, Baral, so now he's just trying to, uh, to go for it. And I guess but, that the uh, good thing for him is that even if everything else goes wrong, he can still do that Grape Shot on yep. Baral. He'll just potentially get a few extra points at the Dome at the same time. Yeah, but he is expending uh, a bunch of uh, resources here in order to uh, cast spells and dig through his library and hasn't found uh, Gibson Given or Pass and Flames yet. He used a Repeal there to deal with Baral Chief of Compliance and that means that he can potentially get a slightly larger storm count going on, potentially not need to use his Grape Shot just yet. Now, one thing I'm kind of intrigued about here, Frank, is whether or not either of these players has the latest iteration of innovation that we saw from Team Ultimate Guard and John Finkel in Pyromancer Ascension in the main deck. This is something that in times gone by was a mainstay of Storm, but kind of fell out of favor for quite a while. Uh, well, Stefan Emmer does have two copies of Pyromancer Ascension in his, uh, in his main deck. Uh, and so does uh, Manuel, so both players uh, run some copies of the enchantment. It, uh, I mean, you, uh, it, it, it effectively gives a similar function as Baral and Goblin Electromancer, as, uh, let's say, a two-mana card that uh, affects the board and that helps your, uh, your combo, but uh, that can uh, yeah, help you cast a whole a bunch of additional spells and uh, generate extra value as you are uh, comboing off. Now the fact that we saw a repeal from Manuel Daninger suggests to me that these two lists may be hauntingly similar. Repeal, not a card that always used to be seen in uh, Storm lists, at least Storm lists in modern, but... Well, I, I think many Storm decks have uh, 
you know, either some repeal or sometimes unsubstantiate in our main deck, mainly as a protection against uh, a meddling mage. Otherwise, uh, if you play against humans, the opponent could uh, name Grape Shot, and you just have no way of, uh, of winning at all from that uh, point in game one. And adverse repeal just draws you a card, which is uh, what the deck likes to do as well. We'll see if uh, Manuel is able to combo off here. I see some rituals, so he can start uh, with that. Uh, what else? I see a Poston Flames, I believe. Goblin Electromancer and what looks to be a Pyromancer Ascension. It may be that he's a little bit light on card drawing here. True. Oh, there we go. Storm count slightly more than one. Yep. Okay, so here's Pyromancer Ascension. So Pyromancer Ascension, it's going to be gaining counters every time Manuel casts spells that there's already a copy of in his graveyard. Once it gets up to a couple of counters on there, then every spell he casts will immediately get copied. Yeah, when you get to the second counter on uh, Pyromancer Ascension, then you get all the free copies. So Manuel has uh, another Pyratic Ritual in hand. He still has the mana to cast it if he likes. Would also put another counter on the Pyromancer Ascension. But from that point on, he's, he's kind of stuck. He wouldn't be able to add anything else to his board. So it looks like Manuel is uh, just setting up for a potential win on the next turn. With Pirate Ritual to already put an extra counter on a Pyromancer Ascension. Two creatures that uh, reduce the cost of spells. And I believe Pass and Flames in hand. Uh, it seems quite likely that he will be able to uh, put together uh, the final Storm turn if he gets to untap. Yeah, each of these players has been in a, pos a potential of in a position of potentially going off uh, for a couple of turns now. Haven't quite been able to string it together, but Stefan Emmett here, he's got a lot of lands to work with. Getting into turn five now. Starts off with Baral, Chief of Compliance, and all immediately right. you can see him starting to get <laughs> all of the things together that he needs to count his storm count. This is where he's hoping to be able to get it all going. Storm count two with that desperate ritual. And here comes Past in Flames with a well-stocked graveyard. Oh yeah, and still enough mana to uh, start casting uh, stuff. So, I, well, it looks indeed like Stefan will be able to uh, set up a kill on this turn, uh, especially given that he already has uh, the the grape shot somewhere. Uh, lots of lots of mana. Uh, every ritual adds effectively two extra mana to your pool with uh, Baral. Mana Morphos also adds one mana. Um, I mean, Mana Morphos now also gives you some additional blue mana potentially, so you can start casting those card draw spells in, uh, in the graveyard. And at some point you get up to, let's say, uh, Storm Count 9 or 10. You can uh, Grape Shot Manuel uh, for half his life total, then uh, use Past and Flames to flash back Grape Shot do it again, and that should be uh, lethal. Now, Stefan actually found himself in a spot of bother as a number of the cards that he was drawing ended up being more copies of Baral, which, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, about the worst draws in his deck at this point. However, these last couple of card drawing spells, they have found him the ritual effects or and or card drawing effects that he needs to continue to keep the trainer rolling. Yep. So it looks like Stefan is just going for the, well, I'm not even going to try to cast two Grape Shots uh, in one turn. Uh, I'm probably going to be able to get up to Storm Count 18 and then cast a lethal uh, Grape Shot. It's the sort of thing that... He's at, at 11 already, so... Yeah. At the point that Grape Shot was printed, compared to the likes of Tendrils of Agony, which was a straightforward <laughs> get 10 spells and then kill someone, 20 spells seemed like crazy talk. Yes. And... That's the world that we're living now in is apparently a pretty crazy world because getting up to a, just a straightforward storm of 20, well, I mean, that's what Stefan has going on here. And I think it's, it's likely on that D12, we're going to have to get to a second dice at some point. I mean, with Boston Flames, where you get to reuse your entire graveyard, it is not that difficult to get up to uh, Storm Count 20. Uh, but also sometimes um, you get up to Storm Count, let's say, 9 naturally, or sometimes even without the Boston Flames. And you can play Grape Shot, uh, remount your own Grape Shot, 
so all the copies resolve and you get the grape shot back into your hand and then recast the grape shot so that you can uh, actually win that way as well. Now in terms of preparation for modern events, in some respects Storm is one of those decks that you can kind of just practice going off with it a lot oh, yeah. and, and do your own thing and treat your practice almost as being a game of solitaire. <laughs> However, the absolute top players that I see with, uh, with Storm lists, firstly, they get to know the format very, very well so they know when they actually need to go off mm -hmm. so they can potentially save themselves a turn, get an extra card draw, an extra land drop. The other thing that's really interesting that happens a little bit more with this particular Storm list, the one that we saw the likes of Martin Mueller and John Finkel playing at the Pro Tour, is they have the potential to turn into a red-blue control deck after sideboarding, where they cut down on some of their uh, big Storm uh, cards and instead go for having more interaction with the opponent and then maybe just using an Empty the Warrens for some plus Blood Moon plus uh, removal to actually get the game done, even matchups that otherwise might look pretty poor. Yeah, that can be particularly useful against decks like uh, humans. And there we see the, yep, that should be the lethal grape shot right now. Um, against decks like humans that have lots of disruptive elements, ranging from Thalia to, uh, to Meddling Mage, uh, adding cards like uh, Grim Lava Monster or Lightning Bolt uh, actually allows you to indeed transform into a blue-red uh, control deck with a bunch of uh, card draw spells, a bunch of removal spells, and yeah, like switch from a con from a combo deck into a control deck, uh, transform your uh, your strategy. The ability to do that uh, is a very important strategic element. So sleight of hand uh, on turn one there from Manuel Danger. Look at two. Put one card in your hand. Tends to be that turn one is all set up for these storm decks. Uh, the addition of opt means that occasionally the card drawing gets deferred until the end of your opponent's turn, but. No card drawing spell on turn one is an unusual draw from these uh, storm lists. That's kind of what they're all about. Yep. Turn two, ideally a cost reducer or a couple of setup spells, and then turn three plus is where potentially the game's all over. Yeah, that is uh, how it works indeed. Uh, Opt was uh, a pretty big addition to the to the deck from uh, from Ixalan. Uh, not just to this deck, but also to uh, various other modern decks like uh, White Blue Control. Uh, it's a great card selection uh, spell that uh, just adds to the consistency of the deck. I believe I do see uh, a red removal spell in uh, Manuel's hand, uh, the Fiery Impulse, uh, I believe. So it looks like the players have added a couple additional disruptive elements. Just those one mana burn spells to kill a cost reducing creature on the other side that can uh, well just help. Uh, stifle a combo on the other side and give you some additional time to uh, set up yours. And Fire M Impulse, of course, it's so easy to have spell mastery in this deck oh, yeah. that it's virtually a lightning bolt, but critically doesn't have the same name. So Meddling Mage uh, doesn't get around uh, all of them. Yep. The other thing, of course, being that Gifts Ungiven a feature and being able to cast value Gifts Ungiven if you want to be a control deck, potentially also relevant. Now. The reason we come back to us, obviously that match was looking pretty good. It was that actually we've hit towards the end of the round. We want to make sure that we have enough time to bring you, well, the next round of Magic when it kicks off. Before we do so, though, firstly, just to let you know that that match did end up 2-0. So the player that won game one was able to emerge victorious. But yep. secondly, to let you know that before we go to our ad break, normally at the end of this round one, we would just have a regular ad break. We've got something a little bit different. Uh, Rich Hagen has a little bit of an announcement for you about some little variations that we're going to have for the coverage of the Legacy at Grand Prix Richmond. So from here in round one, let's move across to Rich. Hello, everyone. I'm Rich Hagen, the Global Coverage Manager for Channel Fireball Events. Together with our partners at Wizards of the Coast, we're always looking for ways to improve and expand our coverage. And for Grand Prix Richmond, for the Legacy GP next Friday and Saturday, we're going to try something very new and very different. For the first time, we're going to follow one of the biggest names in the game through every turn of their Grand Prix experience. And for this unique look under the hood of a tournament, we've turned to one of the best Legacy players in the world, Reed Duke. Now, Reed's going to be sharing with us all his sideboard plans, his views on all the key matchups, exactly what he's doing turn by turn to make his deck win. 
For some rounds, Reed will be our main feature match. And when he's done, he'll join Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth to talk over all the key moments. Some rounds, he'll be on time walk. And that means that he'll join Brian David Marshall and Eduardo Sajgalik and give us a kind of director's commentary, if you will, looking at all the key decision moments as they happen turn by turn through the flow of the game. We're tremendously excited to try this experiment. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that Reed will go deep in the tournament. No pro can guarantee that. But for as long as he's in contention, you'll get to sit behind and beside him as he navigates his way through the legacy gauntlet in pursuit of the Player of the Year title. And all along the way, he'll be teaching us about this most epic of formats. So, Reed Duke, legacy, every turn, every match, starting this Friday morning from Grand Prix Richmond. Fans are the people we want to hear because they are way more fans than there are Wizards employees, for one. Um, and for two, they know what they want to see in this game. And so we have to listen. We are committed to listening to the fans, and we are committed to bringing this experience, an experience together that makes sense to the fans. <laughs>